Uh, along, moving along in this same theme, um, Brian Harvey with the University of Washington, who I've been working with and never met for the last two and a half years, so this is cool. Uh, he's going to be talking about spatial patterns of burn severity in Western Cascadia, characteristics, drivers, and implications for post-fire landscapes. Help me welcome Brian, everybody. All right, let me get oriented here. Whoop. One second talk, I'm already done. Hit it twice, there we go. Um, all right, thanks uh, for the introduction and I'm gonna produce some work that's kind of a double whammy of some results of the actual title of this talk as well as a little bit of a hype talk for some of the work that some of the graduate students in my lab are gonna be pre presenting later today and tomorrow. So I'd like to first acknowledge my co-authors on the uh, the results that I will be presenting, as well as um, give a huge thanks to a lot of collaborators, partners, and funding and support that is behind this work, as well as graduate students and undergraduate students that are listed there. A lot of this work is supported by the PNW Westside Fire Initiative, as well as the um, Northwest CASC, and many other uh, funding support uh, resources that went into this. All right, so. Let's start with a photograph, because who doesn't like a photograph? When we look at this picture, which is, if we were to imagine we were standing in the middle of the Riverside Fire, this is a little bit southwest of Ripplebrook, Oregon, we might have running through our head questions like, what is going on here? How big is this patch? Many of you might think, look at this homogenous giant moonscape of a burned landscape and have questions about how the forest might respond following something like this. And this is kind of a big motivating question for a lot of the research that I'm going to be presenting here. Specifically, focusing on this region of Western Cascadia, which um, is a subset of uh, the west side of the Cascades. And hearkening back to Andrew Marshall's talk this morning, this is specifically focusing on the high severity fire regime typically understood to be uh, north of Salem on the west side of the Cascades and excluding the Willamette Valley and Puget Lowlands. And particularly um, areas where there have been historical records of some fairly large and high severity fires, at least as one piece of the fire regime, and probably a pretty important piece. And we're mostly focusing on two forest zones in here, the noble fir, silver fir zone at higher elevations as well as the Douglas for Western Hemlock Zone in lower elevations that kind of blanket the slopes of the mountains here. And so um, going back to uh, some of the stuff that Andrew brought up this morning, which was a really, uh, really great talk about what could be going on in this interval between large standard placing fires, we, know, we do know that at some point these forests are bookended by large standard placing fires, or at least that has occurred in the past, and we certainly saw that recently. And uh, so when we go from a one-year post-fire to a 700-year-old post-fire, there's a whole lot of stand dynamics that have probably been studied in this part of the world more so than anywhere else on the planet. And if we think about what's actually going on in the landscape, it's a little bit different than that picture, that illustration from Bob Van Pelt, in that we are experiencing contemporary periods where there's a a major deficit of complex early seral and instead a surplus of young and mid seral forests. And then again, when we get into the late seral old growth, we've still got a deficit relative to the historical range or uh, variability in this ecosystem. Whoa, this thing's moving on me. All right. Um, okay. Most of what we know about forest fire ecology in this region is through retrospective approaches, right? It's only been recently that we've had an opportunity to kind of be on the front row and fasten our seatbelts and watch what's happening when fires are burning as well as when forests are responding. But we do have a lot of insights and things that we think we know about these forests that is essentially a rear view mirror where you can go into an older forest and reconstruct what happened. But now we've got this opportunity and this is kind of the, the, the square area where our uh, research is located where we're looking at this with several different partners to look at the drivers, characteristics, and effects of fire in this region of Western Cascadia. Now, Crystal Raymond earlier talked about some of the work on the climate and weather drivers, so I'm gonna focus this specifically on the burn severity patterns 
And then um, a lot of the hype talk is going to be about the uh, post-fire forest ecosystem response. All right, so let's zoom into the burn severity patterns. A subset of our team is basically asking questions about what are the characteristic burn severity patterns? There's been a lot of work that's looked at what are some of the drivers of burn severity in different regions around the world. There's been a lot of work characterizing the spatial signature of burn severity in parts of the world, but um, there's still some questions about what are the characteristic patterns and drivers of burn severity in this part of the world, and we've got this opportunity to now look at that. And so I'm mostly focused on question one here, but with a little bit of a nod to those east wind events and how, how they drive a big amount of variance in this this system. All right, so a shot from the 1988 Yellowstone fires where a lot of people um, following those fires learned a ton about how spatial heterogeneity, even in extremely large fires like this, is critical to ecosystem response and how that system is going to rebound, rebound following that. You name it in terms of anything we could put on this list that is important and responding to that heterogeneity. And that's especially true for stand replacing or high severity disturbances, right? That's the hard reset. That's where we kind of go back to uh, the earliest points in succession in terms of a system responding. So now we've got an opportunity to kind of build a similar type of understanding about heterogeneity, its, its characteristics and its importance in Western Cascadia here using roughly 30 fires, depending on where you want to draw the line, where we've got now a satellite record of this. And so um, I <laughs> appreciate the, uh, the talk by Sebastian and Jeremy setting up the fact that um, there are some problems with using the out-of-the-box MTBS uh, burn severity thresholds. And so um, we have having a little bit of a, a challenge with, with some of those same things of are they telling us the right thing. What we've done is we've built a regionally calibrated burn severity atlas using um, several hundred burn severity plots on the ground that are specific to a range of different forest structure and um, conditions, particularly in this region, where we can take satellite burn severity indices, run them through Google Earth Engine using existing protocols, and then pop out maps of basal area killed by fire, turn those into classified maps, and then if we want, um, turn those into maps of standard placing fire patches. And again, this is all calibrated with field plots, so it is, um, we do have a little bit of a trust in this data set relative to the out-of-the-box MTBS data sets. So using this data set, we have started to characterize in this region of Western Cascadia, again, specifically in this high severity, or this, this area mapped as high severity fire, what are the spatial patterns of burn severity over this time period. And first off, it's kind of a big number to throw out there that about 250 million, or sorry, that would, that would be a really big number, 250,000 hectares, um, or about 600,000 acres, have burned since 1984 in the region. And most of that, kind of riffing again off of Jeremy and Sebastian's talk, has burned at high severity. So over half of that has burned at high severity, or um, greater than 75% mortality in terms of tree basal area. So quite a bit of high severity fire, but it's not all high severity fire. But interesting, and um, agreeing with the, the previous talk, there's kind of a dip in the middle where there's actually, even though it goes, the, the biggest class is from 25 to 75%, that's the lowest total amount of area that's burned at moderate severity. It's a little bit more of a um, feast or famine kind of burn severity pattern here where High severity is the most, followed by low severity, and then moderate severity um, quite a bit less on the landscape. And the reason being is the way these, these fires typically burn, especially the large ones, in a spatial fashion, is the moderate severity is really just kind of a ribbon or a bathtub ring around oftentimes very large high severity patches. So there's lots of fire regimes where there are widespread patches of moderate severity fire. They're a little bit harder to define in this region where instead they're more of a ribbon around high severity patches that are kind of separating high severity to either low or unburned on the other side of that. So now let's look at what fires are contributing to this um, in a pretty big way. So this is now a figure where we've got fires ranked from the smallest on the bottom to the largest on the top, and you'll probably recognize some of those names. Beachy Creek stands out at, at the very largest. And on the x-axis here, we've got the easterly wind component in meters, um, sorry, meters per second. 
And so what you notice is the six largest fires all had most of their area burned during modest to extreme east wind conditions using that uh, threshold that Crystal set up of four meters per second. That's that uh, dashed line, the vertical dashed line there. <clears throat> and to the left of that, you see some of those big fires had not only the center of gravity of area burned was in conditions that were um, windier than that and coming from the east, but actually quite a bit windier if we get, keep going further on that gradient. So as we all know, really strong east wind driven fires. Well, that's important when we're thinking about the spatial patterns of burn severity because those six fires accounted for 88% of the total area burned in Western Cascadia in the recent decades. And they accounted for 88% of the high severity burned area over the, the last several decades. And that's not a coincidence because once fires get to a certain size, they kind of converge on about 50, where are we going here? It's frozen. It's going to probably start bouncing all over the place now. Should I touch it? There, whoa, all right, pay attention, Brian. OK. Uh, you notice that any fire larger than 10,000 hectares converges at about 50 to 60 percent high severity. So that's a pretty big amount of area when you sum it all up in terms of the impact of those fires on the landscape. Um, in total, if we were to think about high severity stand, uh, sorry, high severity or standard placing patches on the west side. There's about 4,000 of them in total, um, ranging in size from smaller than a hectare to single patches, believe it or not, depending on how you want to draw the lines on the map, of 25,000 hectares of a single high severity patch. Most of those are really small patches, like similar kinds of distributions, but the very few largest patches, 12 individual patches of standard placing fire account for 72% of the total standard placing area, or 90,000 hectares is just in those 12 patches, all coming from six east wind driven fire events. So when you think about that picture at the beginning, if we were standing in the middle of one of those patches, we might start to wonder, okay, how is a forest gonna respond given a burn severity pattern like this? What's the distance to seed source in a patch that is that enormous? Well, fortunately, Similar to what was found in things like the Yellowstone fires, those patches are not just a giant circle that's all area with little edge. They're complex in shape. And so what that leads to is that most stand replacing area, 50% of the stand replacing area, right? So almost 50% of the fires didn't burn to stand replacing, meaning they have surviving trees. Of the area that was stand replacing, half of that was well within striking distance of a live forest, less than um, 120 meters, which is well within the dispersal cap capacity of most of our dominant trees. 75% um, of that was within 300 meters, and less than 15% of that is way out there, like 500 meters or greater in these high severity patches. And where you would expect to see post-fire tree regeneration rapidly near those edges, this is probably where we're going to be seeing higher quality and perhaps more um, longer duration complex early serial habitat that is currently in extreme lacking supply across the western slopes. So we know that forests have recovered from fires like this in the past if we go into areas that burned in the Yakult or Tillamook fires or even um, others in, in more recent history, we can see them recovering. But what does the future hold? And it's really interesting to think about some of the work about um, future projections of fire size, fire frequency, and I'll just put a plug right here for first pump up uh, hype talk. Michelle Bonaducci is a PhD student in my lab group who is um, working on some really cool scaling relationships as well as simulating patch size distributions into the future given fires of different sizes based on what we know in the observed record. So stay tuned for that at 9.25 a.m. tomorrow in this very place. All right, so let's go back to the post-fire forest ecosystem response. So that's what's happening, or at least a little bit of a snapshot of what's happening with the fires themselves, but how are these forests coming back? This is where we've got um, another subset of the team which is focusing on several different research questions around post-fire tree regeneration, um, complex early serial conditions in the plant community, 
as well as what are the consequences of these fires for things like carbon and reburn potential, as we've heard a little bit about earlier today. And how we're doing this is, um, it's kind of cool to think about, it's a different site, sort of a, a plot network than the FIA network, um, where these are um, all post-fire plots, but strategically located in areas which I'll talk about in a second here. And so we've got 165 of them that are either completed or um, somewhere near completion in the next few years. Where we're sampling two to six years post-fire for our first measurements. And then there's a whole host of things that we're measuring here on this list. This uh, little diagram on the upper left is not the master plans for the Death Star in Star Wars. That's actually a uh, plot diagram just to demonstrate these are kind of like FIA um, spin-off plots where we're targeting certain things with lots of different subplots in them that's on that list there. And these are permanently monumented to be able to be resampled at um, intervals going forward, recognizing that succession takes a long time. And then these are the eight fires that they're currently distributed across. And within those eight fires, they are stratified across forest zone, so the silver fir zone down to the western hemlock zone, as well as um, stratified across pre-fire stand age of young stands, mid serial stands, and old growth or late serial stands, and then stratified across levels of burn severity, including unburned plots, plots that burned at less than stand replacing, often as a low severity underburn, and then stand replacing plots at varying distances to the live tree edge or distance to seed source. All right, hype talk numbers two and three here. Um, later today, in Flash Talks, uh, Madison Laughlin is going to be presenting some of her graduate work on the post-fire tree regeneration patterns that we're seeing, and some of that um, with some really surprising, early, interesting things that are happening just a few years following these fires. And then Liliana Rangalpara is going to be presenting immediately following that on the um, plant community patterns in these, in these early serial landscapes in this same plot network. And then, final hype talk for the day here. Um, tomorrow, 9.50 in the morning, Jenna Morris is a PhD student who is working on um, characterizing the above ground woody carbon. And then specifically in this talk, she's going to be presenting some of the work on the post-fire fuels and potential for reburn in these that we'll be incorporating into some modeling work going forward. All right. All of this, we are interested in testing the effects of pre-fire stand age. If we go back to that early diagram and we plop on there the amount of area burned using estimates of stand age at the time of the fire from the, um, the gradient nearest neighbor uh, data set produced right here in Corvallis. And we see that um, there's quite a bit of variability in terms of the different kinds of conditions that were, were where the pre-fire forest was different going into it and then different levels of burn severity. Most of that, again, high severity fire. And that is where we're probably going to have the hardest reset, obviously, and where those complex early serial conditions are probably going to be most um, obviously added back onto the landscape. Then you add in the dimension of all of that uh, in a spatial context and diff different distances to seed source. And we can start to imagine these large fires as as much as at first glance we might think they have homogenized the landscape, they are actually happening across this template of lots of different really important factors and producing a whole ton of heterogeneity in the landscape that is really important in, in terms of bringing that heterogeneity back to a lot of these forests where it, it currently is at deficit levels level two or re relative to historical conditions. All of that is just a very beginning glimpse, and it's important to remember that these forests can have lo very long times between standard placing fires, and so um, we are really just on the first leg of a relay race, and it's kind of humbling and fun to think about the people who will be able to measure these plots, similar to the FIA plots, going well into the future, um, and keep this work going and insights coming. Okay. Going back to this picture, what are some insights, at least some of the things that we're taking away so far? Spatial patterns of burn severity are really quite different and much more variable in the small fires, but then they kind of converge on a, a pretty consistent spatial signature in those large fires. Um, 
Those are the east wind driven fires. Those ones have an outsized impact on the landscape patterns of burn severity, therefore an outsized impact on the landscape patterns of that hard set of uh, complex early serial resetting the clock, or at least the potential for complex early serial. And all of that, burn severity pattern, pre-fire forest going in, distance to seed source, all that spatial variability is um, heterogeneous in its own right and is producing and likely to continue to produce a lot of heterogeneity on these landscapes going forward. So tune into those later talks in the symposium if you want to hear more about this research. I am happy to take any questions if there is time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, uh, great question. So the question is about heat propagation in the soil from these fires and what impact that might have on um, soil seed banks. Um, great question. I mean, I, th I think for a lot of the non-tree species uh, and, and some of the seed banking species, that could be a big contributor. Another one that I know we're going to hear a little bit later about um, later today, and we've observed in a lot of these plots, is um, the aerial seed bank that can come from delayed mortality. So even though the heat isn't immediately killing the trees, if the trees hang on long enough to um, fire out another cone crop, we'll find areas where there's not an obvious seed source nearby, you know, by five to 10 years post fire, but um, there's still evidence that that tree didn't, you know, didn't burn up a lot of the fine branches and, and potential cone source. So I, I, I definitely think there's you know, as large and severe as these fires are, um, they're, you know, they're ab abound with biological legacies in the soil and in the, in the crown of these trees as well. Yeah, John. Uh, good question. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Um, specific to the bathtub ring effect, or? Exactly. Yeah, was there more bathtub ring 400 years ago? That's a good question. Um, so, so John asked, uh, is the bathtub ring effect that we're seeing a potential artifact of the continuity of basically like crown to crown coverage as we see in that one picture, right? Um, and, and did it differ historically? Great question. I wish we had a crystal ball to see what the bathtub ring looked like on some of the historical, the Yakult burn and Tillamook burn. Um, I have been really kind of blown away at how consistent that does seem to be on the west side relative to other fire regimes. And it really, I mean, to give you an example, we have intentionally tried to put in moderate severity plots and had the hardest time finding them because we can't fit a plot in the width of where it goes from high severity to underburn, essentially. Um, so I don't know. It's a good, it's a good question of how, how common that was historically. There's you know, probably lots of reasons to believe it is an artifact, or it is a characteristic of, of the way these fires burn in this regime. Uh, it is, it's, it's also, anecdotally, it's common in um, other high severity regimes, if we think about the picture from Yellowstone in 88, right? Like you see the bathtub ring effect on brilliant display there as well. I also want to say, I think I need to credit Dan Donato for the bathtub ring effect, because I think he said that one when we were out there one time. So I stole it from Dan. Now you can steal it from me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one more question. Oh, or by the microphone over here. Should we go to the. Do you want us to talk to this, Cheryl? I, does this microphone work? Is this what you want us to talk into? 
Okay. Um, so what was your, both the out-of-the-box bare product and some of the spatial products you're created, that you created, what was the minimum polygon size? And is that one of the difficult things to tease out with moderate burn severity? Because my understanding is usually with bare, it's kind of a minimum 40-acre polygon. What were you using? Yeah, um, great question. So the question is about uh, the spatial resolution of the burn severity mapping um, data, both in the field and the the imagery. So our burn severity data are coming from field plots that are a range of CBI plots that are meant to match the pixel size of a Landsat satellite, so 30 by 30, but in a circular form, as well as um, some of the larger field plots um, in terms of what we can use to, to ground check them. So the resolution is similar to what a lot of the other remote sensing derived burn severity products are. And, and honestly, you know, it's not you know, it's, it's more accurate, but it still has, you know, varying levels of, of precision. There, you know, there's, there's error associated with it too, which is the dirty secret that nobody likes to talk about with burn severity maps, but. 